Thank you for joining us at XM.com. This is the weekly outlook, and we're heading into next week where we'll hear from the Bank of Japan policymakers and get a slew of economic data out of the United States. I'm Cristina Marujos. Joining me today is our senior investment analyst, Mario Sachiriagos. Mario's looking at Japan. The Bank of Japan meets on Tuesday. There is speculation that policymakers might signal an exit from their stimulus program. Do you think this is a palpable scenario at this week's meeting, or is it a story for next year? Hello, Christina. It's probably a story for next year, I would argue. So, look, developments in Japan lately have been encouraging on the whole, but not quite enough to to really um, make the Bank of Japan uh, adjust its policy, right? They've been stuck in this decade-long stimulus program. And even though they're showing signs that they, they, they are likely to get out, they're likely to exit at some point, it's not likely to happen this month. So let's take a step back. Inflation has fired up in Japan. It's currently running at 3.7%. It's also broadening out. It's not just energy anymore. Now, business surveys, the Tankan, the Bank of Japan's Tankan business survey suggests that business conditions are improving, or at least business morale is improving. And recently we saw a 200 billion spending package from the government being unveiled to help consumers and, and incentivize companies to boost wages. So we had some encouraging developments, but the part that, that's likely to keep the Bank of Japan a little bit hesitant is wage growth. So wage growth has accelerated as well, but not as much as inflation has, right? So Governor Kuroda and the other Bank of Japan policymakers, they can argue, look, inflation dynamics are not self-sustaining yet. We want to see higher wages, and that will make us confident that inflation is... Uh, is domestically generated, and it's the healthy kind of inflation, not the imported uh, energy shock kind of inflation. So we are not quite at the stage of policy changes, but I think that uh, we are likely to see them next year. So Governor Kuroda's term ends in April, and if he's replaced by someone more hawkish, someone who is more open to raising interest rates, well, suddenly that can change the narrative and around the yen. Now, overall, for the yen, I'm getting quite positive. So it was the biggest loser of 2022, but it might be an outperformer in 2023 because most of the elements that destroyed the yen this year, those were interest rate differentials widening against it, energy prices going up, and tourists not being allowed to visit Japan. All of those have started to reverse. So tourists are allowed back on the island, Oil prices have come down, that's positive um, for the, the Japan's terms of trades. And the Bank of Japan might start to tighten policy just a little bit next year, right as other central banks, right as the Fed and the ECB, stop their own tightening cycle. So with recession risks also in, intensifying across the world, this is a, a cocktail, I think, that allows interest rate differentials to compress again to the yen's benefit. Now let's turn to the United States. We'll be getting a barrage of data releases from the U.S. Investors, of course, have turned their attention to the housing market as to gauge the impact of higher interest rates on the U.S. economy. We saw the Fed earlier this week being ultra hawkish, signaling it will raise rates beyond 5% and keep them there until the end of next year. But investors didn't seem too convinced. So could the data releases this week change that narrative? I doubt it. So... The housing data is, of course, going to be very important. Like you just outlined, housing has turned into a leading indicator as we're raising interest rates. It's, a, it's the canary in the coal mine, in a sense, for the entire economy. And, of course, we'll also get the core PC price index. That's the Fed's uh, favorite inflation metric, really. So, look, the Fed tried some shock tactics this week. It raised interest rates. It, it signaled that it's going to raise them higher than the markets think, that it's going to keep them high for longer than the markets think. But th there was a sense that, that investors really didn't buy it. So investors either think that the Fed is bluffing, that they are trying to tighten financial conditions by, by uh, giving out these very aggressive forecasts, or the market believes that the economy is going to be so weak next year that it won't allow them to... That it won't allow their, their interest rate plans to play out. Either way, for the dollar, uh, it's never a good sign when a currency cannot rally on, on positive news. 
We, we've seen this several times uh, recently. The reaction function in the dollar has become a little bit asymmetric and skewed to the downside. By that I mean, when we get negative developments, the dollar can fall quite a lot, for example, uh, with this week with the inflation data, but when we get positive developments, it barely rallies. So I think this is a reflection of positioning. The long dollar trade was very crowded until just a few weeks ago, but it could also be a sign that the, the narrative is turning, right? So overall, I'm neutral on the dollar here. It's relatively difficult for me to envision either massive losses or massive gains because yes, on the one hand, inflation is coming down, the market doesn't believe the Fed is going to raise interest rates so high. Those are negative for the dollar. But on the other side of the spectrum, we've got other major economies, Europe, China. They are in much worse economic shape than America is. So it's unlikely that the dollar is going to go into a full-blown downtrend while the global economy is so fragile. Marius, thanks so much. This was the Weekly Outlook at XM.com.